Hello, and welcome to Beyond the Bell, Access to Activities Beyond the Classroom, by Lauren Eversole and Karen Cassie Wonka. Disability Rights Florida receives its funding, responsibility, and authority under nine federal programs to protect the rights of Floridians with disabilities. It is a non-for-profit corporation since 1987, with offices in Tallahassee, Tampa, Hollywood, and Gainesville, as well as satellite offices in several other communities. Our mission, to advance the quality of life, dignity, equality, self-determination, and freedom of choice of persons with disabilities through collaboration, education, advocacy, as well as legal and legislative strategies. About your presenter, Ms. Lauren Eversol. Ms. Eversol has worked with Disability Rights Florida since 2016. In addition to receiving her law degree from Charleston School of Law in 2014, she graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts in History from UNC Chapel Hill, Go Tar Hills, and has a Master's Social Work degree from the University of South Carolina. Ms. Eversol is a member of the Florida and North Carolina State Bars. She's a staff attorney with Disability Rights Florida on the Advocacy, Education, and Outreach team. Ms. Eversol's work focuses primarily on special education, post-secondary education, and community accessibility. Ms. Eversol is admitted to practice in the U.S. District Courts for the Southern, Middle, and Northern Districts of Florida. About your presenter, Ms. Karen Castain Blanco. Ms. Castain Blanco has worked with Disability Rights Florida since 2019. She received her law degree from St. Thomas University School of Law and her Bachelor of Science from the University of Central Florida. Ms. Cassian Blanco is a member of the Florida State Bar. She is a staff attorney with Disability Rights Florida on the Advocacy, Education, and Outreach team. Ms. Cassian Blanco's work focuses primarily on primary and secondary special education. Ms. Cassian Blanco is admitted to practice in the U.S. District Courts for the Southern, Middle, and Northern District of Florida. What we will cover. Applicable laws, regulations, and guidance that govern accessibility to activities for children with disabilities beyond the school day. Case examples, advocacy and legal strategies, and hypotheticals. Activities beyond the school day. School-based extracurricular activities and programs. Examples include field trips, athletics, student organizations, student clubs, chorus, band, and drama. School-based before and after school programs. Community-based programs, including public or private. Examples include recreational sports and summer camps. Benefits of extracurricular and after-school activities. Improved academic performance, lower dropout rates, increased opportunity for socialization with peers, increased self-esteem and sense of belonging, safety and supervision, structured academic support, exposure to new interests, boosts college applications and resumes. Benefits of inclusion of children with disabilities. Mutually beneficial. Provides opportunities for children with disabilities to develop social and communication skills. Increased contact with peers without disabilities will help prepare for life after school. Children without disabilities will have the opportunity to learn and appreciate diversity and prepare for life in an inclusive society. Opportunity for all to build and maintain friendships. Legal authority. The Individuals with Disability Education Act, or IDEA, and its implementing regulations. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and its implementing regulations. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, or ADA. Title II and its implementing regulations, as well as Title III and its implementing regulations. IDEA. The IDEA makes available a free, appropriate public education, or FAPE, to eligible children with disabilities throughout the nation and ensures special education and related services to those children. IDEA eligibility. To be eligible for special education under the IDEA, a child must have a disability under one of the following categories and must need special education services and related services. Autism spectrum disorder, deaf or hard of hearing, developmentally delayed, dual sensory impairment, emotional behavioral disability, hospital homebound, intellectual disabilities, language impairment, orthopedic impairment, other health impairment, specific learning disabilities, speech impairment, traumatic brain injury, 
or visual impairment. And now let's dive deeper. IDEA and extracurricular activities. The IDEA and its implementing regulations mandates that school districts take steps, including the provision of supplementary aids and services, determine appropriate and necessary to afford children with disabilities, an equal opportunity for participation in extracurricular activities. And it also defines non-academic and extracurricular activities to include counseling services, athletics, transportation, health services, recreational activities, special interest groups, or clubs sponsored by the public agency. This list is not exhaustive. The individual education plan must include any supplementary aids and services that the student will need to participate in the activity. There is nothing in the IDEA regulations that requires IEP teams to exclude non-academic activities from a student's IEP because they are not required to educate the student. In a case called Independent School District Number 12, Centennial versus Minnesota Department of Education, the district was found to violate the IDEA by refusing to consider supplemental aids and services requested by the parents to enable the student's participation in after-school sports and clubs. Here are some examples of supplementary aids and services that can be provided under the IDEA. One is interpreting services. There was a case where the district's failure to provide a qualified interpreter for a deaf student during football practice, as provided in the student's IEP, violated the IDEA and denied the student an equal opportunity to participate as a football team manager. Behavioral supports. There was a case where the district was found to be in violation of the IDEA by failing to provide appropriate behavioral supports to a child that was excluded from attending a good behavior field trip due to ongoing behavioral issues in the classroom. There are limitations under the IDEA. A district may place reasonable limits on the participation in extracurricular activities for safety reasons. For instance, there was a case where a student with a visual impairment who played the saxophone in the band was placed in the flute section instead of the saxophone section by his band leader. This was done to minimize the risk of collision with other members of the band. Also, there was a case where a student was found not to be improperly excluded from non-academic activities due to severe behavioral concerns. In the case of the behavioral concerns, I do want to stress that it's important to revisit the IEP to make sure that appropriate behavioral supports and services are in place to ena enable access and participation in extracurricular activities. In addition to the IDEA, Section 504 and Title II of the ADA provide for equal access to non-academic and extracurricular activities for students with disabilities. Section 504 is a federal law that prohibits any entity that receives federal financial assistance from discriminating against persons with disabilities. Title II of the ADA is a federal law that prohibits state and local governments from discriminating against persons with disabilities. In general, Section 504 and Title II non-discrimination standards are the same, and in general, actions that violate Section 504 also violate Title II, and both Section 504 and Title II apply to school districts. Section 504 and Title II of the ADA provide that a person with a disability means a person with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, has a record of such impairment, or is regarded as having such an impairment. <clears throat> the determination of whether a student has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, and therefore has a disability, must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. The definition must be viewed to provide broad coverage of individuals. So if a student doesn't meet eligibility under the IDEA for an IEP, but has a disabling condition that meets this definition listed here on the slide, then Section 504 in Title II will apply. 
to that student. Section 504 regulations require that school districts provide non-academic and extracurricular services and activities in such a manner as is necessary to afford disabled students an equal opportunity to participate. Similarly, Title II regulations of the ADA require public entities to make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, or procedures when the modifications are necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of disability unless the public entity can demonstrate that making the modifications would fundamentally alter the nature of the service, program, or activity. This applies to the non-academic and extracurricular activities operated by school districts. The U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, or OCR, is responsible for enforcing Section 504 and Title II of the ADA. In 2013, OCR issued guidance clarifying the existing obligations of school districts to provide students with disabilities an equal opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities. School districts must not exclude students based on stereotypes and assumptions, and school districts must make an individualized inquiry to determine if there are reasonable modifications or necessary aids and services which would allow a student with a disability to take part in the activity. OCR guidance has provided examples of reasonable modifications or necessary aids and services. These include Using a light along with a starter pistol so that a runner with a hearing impairment can compete. Providing for or assisting with the administration of needed medicine like insulin so that a student with diabetes can take part in an after school gymnastics club. However, the requirement to provide an equal opportunity does not mean changing essential elements that affect the fundamental nature of the game. Giving a student with a disability an unfair advantage over other competitors. Changing the nature of selective teams. Students with disabilities have to compete with everyone else and legitimately earn their place on the team. Or compromising student safety. The guidance also notes that a school district need not provide a modification, aid, or service if doing so would put an undue burden on its program. In most cases, however, OCR believes that providing reasonable modifications and necessary aids and services should not be unduly burdensome. In addition to extracurricular activities and athletics, before and after school programs provided by school districts are often an area of concern with respect to providing equal access to students with disabilities. Section 504 in Title II of the ADA apply to before and after school programs run by school districts as well as district sponsored programs. In order to determine if a before and after school program is indeed district sponsored, OCR will look at several factors that will connect the district to the program. These factors include but are not limited to whether or not the District provides direct or indirect financial support, such as paying for the staff who run the program, whether the district provides rent-free facilities on school property, whether the program uses the district's website to advertise, whether the program follows the district's policies, including its disciplinary policy, and whether the district provides administrative services to the program. To reiterate, Section 504 Regulation states that no qualified individual with a disability shall, on the basis of disability, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or otherwise be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity which receives financial assistance from the department. The regulation implementing the ADA contains a similar provision. Section 504 regulation provides that a recipient who provides daycare may not, on the basis of disability, exclude qualified persons with disabilities 
and shall take into account the needs of such persons in determining the aid, benefits, or services to be provided. In other words, this is an individualized inquiry made on a case-by-case -case basis. Pursuant to OCR policy, when voluntary non-educational programs are offered on a free or tuition basis, qualified children with disabilities may not be categorically excluded from those non-educational programs on the basis of their disabling condition. OCR policy further provides that parents of children with disabilities may not be required to provide their own aids and babysitters to care for their children where the parents of non-disabled children are not subject to the same requirements. And parents of children with disabilities may not be charged more than the parents of non-disabled children are charged for their children's participation in the program. The ADA requires that a public entity has to make reasonable modifications that are not a fundamental alteration of the program. So a public entity is required to make reasonable modifications in policies, practices, or procedures when the modifications are necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of disability, unless the public entity can demonstrate that making the modifications would fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activity. The regulation implementing the ADA does not require a public entity to take any action that it can demonstrate would result in a fundamental alteration in the nature of the service program or activity. The regulation implementing the ADA further provides that in those circumstances where personnel of the public entity believe that the proposed action would fundamentally alter the service program or activity, a public entity has the burden of proving that compliance with this provision would result in such alteration. The decision that compliance would result in such a burden must be made by the head of the public entity or his or her designee after considering all resources available for use in the funding and operation of the service, program, or activity, and must be accompanied by a written statement of the reasons for reaching that conclusion. Pursuant to OCR policy, providing additional supervision in a daycare program, such as a one-to-one -one aid, will not ordinarily change the fundamental nature of a program that is designed purely to provide supervision for children. The ADA also does not require a public agency to take any action that it can demonstrate will be an undue burden. Undue burden is defined as an action requiring significant difficulty or expense. Some factors to be considered in assessing whether a burden is undue include the nature and cost of the accommodations needed, the overall financial resources of the facility providing the reasonable accommodations, and the number of persons employed at such facility. Further factors include the effect on expenses and resources, the impact otherwise of such accommodation upon the operation of the facility, the overall size of the entity, the type of operations of the entity, including the composition, structure, and functions of the workforce, and the geographic separateness, administrative, or fiscal relationship of the facility in question to the covered entity. ADA regulation prohibits a public entity from placing a surcharge on a particular individual with a disability or any group of individuals with disabilities to cover the cost of measures, such as the provision of auxiliary aids or program accessibility, that are required to provide that individual or group with non-discriminatory treatment. OCR policy has established that in daycare programs run by public educational entities, such as school districts, providing extra supervision to a child with a disability ordinarily will not unduly burden a recipient. And where undue burden has not been demonstrated, recipients must provide each child with services necessary to his or her meaningful enjoyment of the benefit offered. Additionally, ADA regulation provides that 
the decision that compliance would result in such a burden must be made by the head of the public entity or his or her designee after considering all resources available for use in the funding and operation of the service program or activity and must be accompanied by a written statement of the reasons for reaching that conclusion. Here are some examples of reasonable accommodations. For students with behavioral issues, we can look at behavioral plans or reward systems. Also, for students with behavioral concerns or complex medical needs, we can look at one-to-one -one aids. A court actually found that a district denied a student equal participation in its after-school program by failing to provide any services for his colostomy bag while he attended. It's important for parents and school districts to be aware that under Florida law, medical services can be delegated to non-medical personnel as long as they have been provided with child-specific training by qualified medical personnel. There are limitations to Section 504 in Title II of the ADA. If a student is determined to be a direct threat to the health or safety of others, then that student would not be qualified for purposes under the ADA or 504 to participate in the program. However, this determination that the student is a direct threat must be based on an individualized assessment, which considers various factors such as the nature, duration, and severity of the risk, the probability that the potential injury will actually occur, and whether reasonable modifications of policies, practices, or procedures will mitigate the risk. So for instance, a child with behavioral concerns, um, you know, the provision of a one-on-one -on -one aid might mitigate the risk of this student being a threat to the health and safety of others within the program. So moving on from district-sponsored programs um, let's look at extracurricular activities provided by other public entities and also private entities. So some examples of these include municipal sports activities, summer camps, privately run child care centers, and religious-based programs. The laws that apply to non-school district programs include Title II of the ADA, which applies to public entities, meaning any state or local government program, any department, agency, special purpose district, or other instrumentality of a state or local government. Um, Title II is intended to apply to all programs, activities, and services provided or operated by state and local governments. Section 504 only applies to programs or activities receiving financial assistance from the federal government. Because many state and local government operations, such as courts, licensing, and legislative facilities and proceedings do not receive federal funds, they are beyond the reach of Section 504. Sometimes determining whether or not a program is part of a public entity and thus subject to Title II of the ADA is not always clear. So where an entity appears to have both public and private features, it is necessary to examine the relationship between the entity and the governmental unit to determine whether the entity is public or private. So there are factors that are considered for this determination, which include whether the entity is operated with public funds, whether the entity's employees are considered government employees, whether the entity receives significant assistance from the government by provision of property or equipment, and whether the entity is governed by an independent board selected by members of a private organization or a board elected by voters or appointed by elected leaders. Here's an example of a non-school district public entity subject to Title II of the ADA. It is the town of Rocky Hill, Connecticut. In 2012, the Department of Justice, who was responsible for enforcing Titles II and III of the ADA, entered into a settlement agreement with the town of Rocky Hill. The town agreed it would modify its policies, 
provide ADA training to staff and awarded monetary compensation to the complainants after it refused to admit children using insulin pumps to a town operated parks and recreation program. Here are some examples of private programs which are subject to Title III of the ADA. Title III of the ADA applies to places of public accommodation, commercial facilities, and the obligations of Title III only extend to private entities. State and local government entities are public entities covered by Title II of the ADA, not by Title III. Some examples are privately run summer camps, child care programs, and recreational activities. Title III of the ADA provides that private programs must not discriminate against persons with disabilities on the basis of disability and provide an equal opportunity to participate. It cannot exclude children with disabilities from their programs unless their presence would pose a direct threat to the health or safety of others or require a fundamental alteration of the program. Private programs must make reasonable modifications to their policies and practices to integrate children, parents, and guardians with disabilities into their programs unless doing so will constitute a fundamental alteration. These programs must provide appropriate auxiliary aids and services needed for effective communication with children with disabilities when doing so would not constitute an undue burden. Religious-based programs. Programs that are actually run by religious entities such as churches, mosques, or synagogues are not covered by Title III. Programs that are operating on the premises of a religious organization, however, are generally not exempt from Title III. So for example, if a private child care program is operated out of a church, pays rent to the church, and has no other connection to the church, the program has to comply with Title III, but the church does not. There are advocacy and legal strategies and resources available to you. You can always start out with an advocacy letter. In the case of a school district, you know, um, it would be good to put the school district on notice that your child is a child with a disability. For purposes of Section 504 and Title II of the ADA, and that the school district is subject to complying with Section 504 and Title II of the ADA, and that you're requesting reasonable accommodation um, in the situation of, you know, programs run by counties or local governments, towns, like we discussed earlier, um, you know, putting those programs on notice that they're subject to Title II of the ADA in your letter. Um, and then in the case of private programs, putting them on notice that they're subject to Title III of the ADA. And, you know, regardless of whether or not a program is subject to Title III, Title II, or Section 504. They have to provide reasonable accommodations um, to ensure equal access unless that accommodation would constitute a fundamental alteration or a new burden. If you receive any denials or you're met with resistance, you know, please request that they be put in writing as that is a requirement. If these programs are asserting that they're a fundamental alteration and undue burden, they, they have to prove that they are, and um, they have to put those denials in writing. <clears throat> in the case of school districts, you have District 504 grievance procedures available to you. Um, every school district should have these and should have an individual who is responsible for overseeing the grievance procedures. So check with your school district on that. In the case of a student who is being denied a free and appropriate public education by being denied um, aids and services to enable equal participation in extracurricular activities or athletics, you know, there is a state complaint procedure available through the Florida Department of Education Bureau of Exceptional Education Program. <clears throat> Um, 
The Office of Civil Rights through the U.S. Department of Education has a complaint program that is available for violations of Section 504, Title II. So definitely in the case of a school district who you feel is violating your child's Section 504 or Title II of the ADA rights, OCR is um, a viable avenue for you. And I have the link here so that you can learn more about the process. Um, Similarly, the Department of Justice has a complaint process that I've uh, attached a link to, and DOJ would be who you would go to um, when you are experiencing uh, issues with those state local government programs subject to Title II of the ADA or private programs that are subject to Title III. And then lastly, there are uh, due process procedures available under the IDEA. Um, again, if you're if you feel like your child is being denied a free and appropriate public education as a result of being denied access to these programs, um, and also Section 504 due process um, is available. You know, aside from from the special education or IDEA due process procedures, so I would just um, you know reach out to to the school district um, director to find out more about those. Um, or you can reach out to Disability Rights Florida, um, and I will get to our information here shortly. But first, I'd like to go over some hypotheticals that will help illustrate and, and put into context some of these complex legal analyses that I know we've been discussing. Um, Hypothetical number one here uh, talks about a, a local hospital that provides and administers a summer camp program for children called Fun in the Sun. The summer camp is generally scheduled for eight weeks in the summer. Camp activities include games, sports, crafts, swimming, and field trips. The parents of a child with type 1 diabetes who needs constant glucose monitoring and insulin administration sought to enroll her in the camp. The camp refused to enroll the child, stating that it does not have a nurse available to provide medical services. The mother of the child has to take FMLA to care for her child over the summer as a result. So just take some time to think about this. Uh, think about what, what laws apply um, and what the results should be, um, what the schools are, I'm sorry, what the hospital's obligations are, and uh, we'll get to the answer toward the end. I'm going to move over to the next hypothetical. Hypothetical number two, a child in Sunshine School District with an IEP for speech and language impairment is nonverbal and uses assistive technology device to communicate with others. The child knows some ASL and wishes to participate in chorus with his friends. Hypothetical number three, an after-school program in Sunshine District has a policy that students must be able to appropriately behave according to its code of conduct in an environment where supervision is provided at a 1 to 25 adult to students ratio. A student with an IEP for autism spectrum disorder and language impairment is suspended from the program due to disruptive behaviors such as elopement and throwing objects towards others. So hypothetical number one comes from a real life case. Um, <clears throat> there was a settlement agreement between the U.S. Department of Justice and Hospital for Special Care. Um, you can find it at this website that I have provided the link to here. Um, this hospital was found to be a public entity under Title III or subject to Title III of the ADA. And um, as part of this settlement agreement, the hospital agreed to modify, modify its policies to prohibit discrimination on the basis of a disability, provide mandatory ADA training to employees of the camp, and make best efforts to seek waivers for non-medical staff to administer insulin and glucagon from the state's Department of Public Health, to administer certain medications before the start of the summer, and to restore the mother's loss, family, and medical leave.
this hypothetical um, doesn't come from a, a case, but just kind of comes from a, a personal advocacy story. <clears throat> um, in this case, the district is, of course, subject to Section 504 of the Rehab Act, as well as Title II of the ADA. Um, it would most likely be obligated to provide the child with an ASL interpreter as a reasonable accommodation to enable the child to equally participate in chorus. This is not a fundamental alteration as one fundamental aspect of course is to convey meaning and emotion through lyrics and song, which can be achieved through ASL. So in this case, the ASL interpreter um, taught uh, the child how to sign the songs that were sung in chorus and um, the child was able to participate that way um, and, and the audience loved it. So hypothetical number three, we're talking about, again, a school district. Um, this is obviously a district run or sponsored program. And the district would be subject to Title II of the ADA as well as Section 504. Um, the language in the Code of Conduct is problematic because it is exclusionary to children with disabilities that may need supervision beyond what a 1 to 25 adult to child ratio can provide. Additionally, the after-school program is legally obligated to engage in an interactive process with the parent and guardian to make an individualized determination on what reasonable accommodations may be implemented to mitigate the child's behavior, including but not limited to an extra adult to increase the ratio of supervision or an aid to provide direct su supervision to the child. Here's a list of helpful links that can provide you with information on this subject matter, as well as uh, information on any other disability or education related matters. Last but not least is Disability Rights Florida's contact information. You can call us toll free at 1-800-342-0823 to request assistance or, you know, if you have any questions um, or you know, you need to be pointed in the right direction for something. We have a wonderful intake team available to help. If you would rather request assistance online, you may do so at disabilityrightsflorida.org. Um, we also have a lot of information and, and, and resources on our website that can help you. Um, and, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and, and I hope that you've learned a lot from it. And uh, Please call us if you have any additional questions or, or need our assistance. Thank you. One last thing, your input matters to us. Please visit the link below between now and July 31st, 2021 to complete our annual public input planning survey. Your responses will help us plan our goals, priorities, and objectives for 2022.